I'm on, whoa. <laughs> they told me that the, uh, that guilty was uh, kind of the theme of the camp this week. So when I give you the title of the message, you'll probably think, well, what's that got to do with it? The title of the message is Worship. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read some scriptures a little later on, but I'm not going to start off with the scriptures. I don't always do things the same way. <clears throat> Excuse me. Sometimes I give them first. Sometimes I give them during the sermon. Sometimes I give them at the end. And so I want to ask some questions today. And it's up to you to decide about the guilty part of it. Now, I'm going to ask you some questions, and I don't want you to answer audibly. I want you to think about them in your mind. And if I do ask you a question I want to answer, I'll ask for an answer. I would like to say I wonder why some of the boys were here, and they got up and sang and did their part, and then they left, and they had to come back. And I wonder, last night we had a big crowd in here. And I can understand a few people cooking, a few people not being in here, but there's probably half of the people nearly that are not here today that were here last night to service. And I have to ask, why? So that's my first question. <clears throat> why did you come to the church service today? We'll give you a little time to think about that. Now this is a conversation between you and God. It's not between you and me. Between you and God. What would you tell him if he asked you, why did you come to the church service today? What if he said, what was your attitude? about coming to the worship service today. Would you have rather been somewhere else? Would you have rather been playing games or outside doing something or sleeping in your camper or whatever? What was your attitude about coming to the service today? But I want you to think about this not only today, but what's your attitude when you go to church on Sabbath? Now I'm not saying that our worship is uh, just Sabbath or one day a week, we know that worshiping God is a seven day a week something that we're supposed to be doing. But what's your attitude when you go to church on Sabbath? Uh, do you spring out of the bed and I want to be there on time? Or well, I've had a hard week. I think I'll just kind of lay in and, and uh, I'll get there at some point in time. What if Jesus had took that attitude about going to the cross for you? I want you to think about this thing. What's my attitude? Do I think it's a duty or do I think it's a privilege to go into his house? Do I just go because people expect me to be there? Or, well, I'm the Sabbath school teacher. I guess I should be there. Or, uh, I play the piano. I guess I better be there. What's your attitude when you go to church? Let me ask you the next question. Why do you worship God? Think about that for just a minute. Why do I worship God? If you ever think about that, do you take inventory? Quite often, or maybe more often than I should, I speak to the church of Tulsa and I ask them questions like that. I say, do you ever take inventory of your life? Do you 
think about these kind of questions. Why not go to church? Why do I worship Him? Do I worship Him like I did when I first felt that tug of the Spirit and convicted me of sin? Do I worship Him now like I did then? Is my relationship with Him just as strong now as it was then? If I asked some of these men in here are married, I'd say, now, whenever you were courting your wife, uh, you wanted to be there on time. Uh, you wanted to spend time with her. And I would say, Brother Wayne, I will ask you a question. With you and your wife, has your relationship grown stronger or weaker over time? Stronger. Amen. And that's the way it should be. Isn't that the way it should be with you and your Heavenly Father? Absolutely. A husband and wife go through many things in life. Sometimes uh, wonderful things. Sometimes they go through some difficulties. But they learn to trust in one another. You see, when we make a covenant with God, when we say, uh, I'm a sinner. I want to be forgiven. I want to receive the Lord Jesus as my Savior. We are entering into a covenant with God. And we're saying, I want to love you. I want to be loved. I want to be part of the family. I know that I can count on you. Well, God wants to know the same thing. Can He count on you? And I would ask you, your jobs, do you take the attitude that, well, I guess I can be there just about whenever I want to on my job? Or do you have to get up and get with it and be on the job on time? Y'all are being pretty quiet. Of course, I, I hadn't really asked you too many questions. But that's the truth. But yet, not only do I find it in the Tulsa church, but I visit other Church of God churches, and I find too many of the people come in whenever they decide they want to. There's a set time that the church service is supposed to start, and half the church don't show up until halftime. What if the football team just showed up at halftime? We're supposed to be excited about this. It's not supposed to be, well, I guess I can drag out of the bed. I, I guess I can get up. I, I guess I can make it to service. But I'll tell you what, I don't know about the other ministers, but I get totally frustrated at the church in Tulsa. I'm going to just tell off on them a little bit. I got half of my crowd don't show up to the worship service. They don't come to the Bible study. And some of them don't even come in halfway through the worship service. And I'm thinking, well, why did you even come at all? Is that the way you love God? Is that the way you want to show Him that you love Him? And the truth of it is, I've been to some of the other Church of God churches, and I find it goes on there too. And it should not be. If there's a set time, you need to be there. You should be there before time. A lot of you that are young don't know this, but some of us who are older, if you go back in time, a lot of the old folks would come to church and find a place and start praying before the service. And now we think, well, if somebody says a prayer during the service, boy, we really worship the Lord today. Y'all are being pretty quiet, but you know I'm telling the truth. Jesus said it'd be a house of prayer, didn't he? Me and one of the brothers was talking about this a while ago, and I find this true even over Tulsa. I find that once the sermon's over, and, the, and we've said the benediction prayer, that the people get more excited trying to get out of the church visiting with one another than they did showing emotion and, and uh, getting within the service. Getting into the service and worshiping the Lord. Well, you see, he's watching. He's watching. He's watching what our attitude is. Why did they come to church? We can't fool him. He knows why we come and whether we do it out of heart of love. So that would be the next question. I've already given you a hint. 
Why should you come to the house of God and worship? You can answer. You can answer. Absolutely. Isn't that so? Isn't that the reason that we should go to the house of worship? Because we love God. Not to entertain. We're not here to entertain. We're not here to sing and entertain people. We're not here to be entertained. Matter of fact, I had a young man uh, read something from one of the live stream courses recently, and he said, it seems that so many of the people in the church anymore come because they, they just want to be entertained. That's not why we come to the church house to be entertained. We're supposed to come to the church house with an offering. Let's look at 1 John 4 and 19. We love Him because He first loved us. You remember how you loved Him when you first began to worship Him and following Him? You remember you couldn't wait to get to the church house. I've got to be there. I want to be there. I want to read the Bible at home. I want to worship the Lord and not just in the church house. But now too often we come to church and we feel like, well, if I've, I've been there about an hour, we sung a couple of songs and the minister read a couple of scriptures and hey, I'm good for the week. I've done my deed. Boy, if Jesus just took that attitude, you and I would be in pretty sorry shape, wouldn't we? If he just, about an hour a week, I guess I could help these poor folks. Sometimes we think we're worshiping, but I wonder. But I thought about uh, I thought about something in Luke chapter 17. It's always been a, uh, a favorite passage of mine. This is the one where the ten lepers, you know, they were stay off to their self. They knew that Jesus was passing by and apparently they knew something about Him, Brother Tim. There was something they'd either heard or they saw a miracle or something. Something touched them. Or maybe the Spirit was working in their life. I don't know. But when they saw Him, they lifted up their voice and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when He saw them, He said to them, Go show yourselves unto the priest. And it came to pass as they went, they were cleansed. But nine of them just kept on going down the road. But one of them did something very important. One of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back and with a loud voice, glorified God! And fell on his face at his feet, giving thanks, and he was a Samaritan. This is the one that and Jesus answered and said, Were there not ten cleansed? But where are the nine? They were not found that returned to give, to give glory to God, save this stranger. You're getting a recycled message because I gave this one to the church at Tulsa and I thought it'd be good for you as well. I told them, I said, since the time that I've been here as your pastor, if everyone who come in this church had said, I love the Lord and I think I want to attend here, I said, if we had all those today that still live within 75 miles of this church, we'd be full in here today, but where are they at? I love Him. I love Him. But they're not in His house. They're not in His house. But I love Him. They say. And I would say that I could probably ask some of the other ministers if some of that gone on in some of the congregations you've been, and you'd say, absolutely. Too many come and go. But I love him. I love him. Let's ask this question. 
in Matthew 22, in verse 36, it says, one lawyer was speaking to the Master, and he said, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. And my question today is, do you love him that way? Do you love him that way? That's what Jesus says. That was the greatest commandment. So if I say, I love him that way, I love him with all my heart, soul, and mind, but I'll go to church sometimes. I'll go whenever I get ready. I'll be there some point in the service. Uh, I'll go and somebody will sing a song. Somebody will lead a Bible study. But I'll just listen. I don't get involved. But I love Him with all my heart, my soul, and my mind. Do we really? Do we really? You can't fool God. You cannot fool God. It's just impossible to do it. What did he say to the church in Revelation? If you look warm, I'll spew you out. And the truth of it is, there's too much lukewarmness in the church today. Again, we go to church for a little while, maybe an hour if we get there on time, and then, oh, I've done my part this week. I've done my part. I wonder if God thinks we've done our part. It's more important what He thinks, isn't it? All right, let's go to uh, First Chronicles. Would you say your worship fits this? Do you, would you say your love fits this? It says, Give unto the Lord the glory due unto His name. Bring an offering. Come before Him. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. You don't have to answer audibly. I'm asking you in your mind to rationalize these questions. You'd say, well, I give an offering. I, we put a few ties in back there and once in a while I put in a little offering. I bring an offering. I'm not talking about that kind of offering. Not at all. Romans chapter 12, it says you're supposed to present your bodies a living sacrifice. And this morning, Brother Wayne, you were talking about these are temples of God. He dwells in them. Would you say that your worship, your love, your dedication, are you living your life so that this is truly a holy house for Him to dwell in. I'm asking you to think about these things. Think about that for a moment. What kind of offering can I bring? We usually have in our churches, we have someone who leads a Bible study. But the truth of it is, you should be there on time and you shouldn't come and say, well, I'm going to see what He has to say. You should have been looking and seeing what the Lord had to say during the week. Because the truth of it is, I often use this illustration. You ladies, you don't understand. You take, you're going to make a pot of soup. Well, let's just say we put a couple ingredients in it. Oh, I guess it has some flavor. But what happens if you keep putting more and more ingredients in there? makes that soup moment so much better. Okay, let's just say in here, let's say we were having a Bible study and the brother here, he, he asked a good question that gets us all thinking. Or he makes a good comment because he's been studying and the Lord's put something on his mind and he, he gives us something that gives us some food for thought. You have a question. You have a thought. Each one of you come. And everyone in the class that's getting involved, it just makes that so much better. You see, it's not supposed to be just the teacher 
It's supposed to be your study during the week and you come and you have something to put in the spiritual pot, soup pot. That's worship. If you know how to sing. I actually, I probably shouldn't tell this, but I preached a message one time, you can't say no. It was at a revival. But there were some different ministers preaching in this revival. Well, I laughed because I had some other things to do and I heard the rest of the week, every time somebody refused to do something, they'd say, you can't say no! You know, they'd ask somebody, would you sing? Say, well, I don't think I... You can't say no! They'd ask somebody else, would you testify? I, you can't say no! You see, but oftentimes we do that. We're in the church and we well, I don't think I can say... I don't have one. I didn't bring my guitar pick. What'd you come to the church house for if you wasn't going to get involved? Come on now. Amen, brother guy. Amen. You know, I do that over at the church once in a while. If they get too quiet, I just amen myself. <laughs> I, I, I'm hoping that eventually it'll catch on. But that's the truth. Why do you come to the church house if you don't intend to get involved? That's what it's called. Worship. 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 We get involved. And that means young people too. Everyone get involved. Somebody might say, well, I sweep the floor. That's a great offering. But I submit to you, there's more you can do. I can ask some of these men, especially the ministers, did you just suddenly one day become a minister? Did you just start preaching and that was it? Most of us would say that we worked up through the ranks. Probably, maybe at some point in time, we took the Bible study occasionally. After a while, they said, Hey, would you just take it all the time and lead the Bible study? Does that happen to any of you besides me? I actually didn't want to. I got thrust into it. But you know, I, this is one thing I did. When I come to an altar and I ask God to save me, and I had a lot of sin that needed to be covered up. I said, you open the doors, I'll go. I'll go. Brother Wayne, he's opened up a lot of doors since then. So you've got to watch what you tell God, because He'll do that. He'll, and I'm sure you fellas know what I'm talking about. He opens up doors, but sometimes we don't want to step through. Well, I don't think I can do that. You're not doing it on your own. And I think Wayne made a comment about that either this morning or last night. We don't go in our own strength. He's just asking us to be a tool. And He's going to use us. And the thing is, it's a progressive, it's a progressive thing. I'm not saying uh, He can't do something miraculous and all at once. But Stephen was a wonderful deacon. But boy, I'll tell you what. Besides Jesus and Paul, He probably preached one of the best messages one day and then they stoned him for it. There was a progression there. But why do we come to the church house? Why do we really come? Why do we just like a days ago about it? How come we don't do it like we're dating our sweetheart? Now boy, she's I've got to be over at her house on time. I told her I'd be there at seven o'clock. I'm not gonna be there today. But we don't treat God like that too often. Too often we decide we'll come to church when we want to. We'll get involved if we want to. We'll do what we want to. Again, I have to ask the question other than those cooking, where's all the others that was in the service last night? Why aren't they here in the service today? Well, let's get all this stuff. I had some more. But we'll, we'll get on and cut on down to it here a little bit. Let's go to Revelation chapter 4 and verse 1. Let's see how some people worship God and then let's see where we stand. You know sometimes that holy men, the Spirit of God would come upon them. Sometimes they would see visions. Sometimes they would have dreams. Uh, God would uh, have angels appear to them. So there were many ways. But John says, After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was, as it were, of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee 
things which must be hereafter to come. They had not happened yet. And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardis stone, and there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. And around about the throne were four and twenty seats, and upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment. They were in their righteousness. That white raiment represents their righteousness. And they had on their heads crowns of gold. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunders and voices. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was a sea of glass, like in the crystal. And in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. And the first, if you want to know about these, look at Isaiah chapter 6 and you'll find out it's talking about seraphims. And the first beast was like a lion, and the second beast like a calf. And the third beast had a face as a man, and the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. And the four beasts had each of them six wings about him. They were full of eyes within. But here's the most important thing, and I want you to notice what they do, and I want you to think about how we worship God. And it said, And they rested not day or night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is to come. And then you ask yourself, and I think I worship God once in a while, a little bit. It said day and night they don't rest. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, which was and is to come. And when these beasts give glory and honor and thanks to Him that sat on the throne, who liveth forever and ever, the four and twenty elders, they fall down before Him. Before Him. That's what they do. That's the way they worship. And we think we, if we get down on our knees every once in a while, we think we've done something. We need to ask ourselves, do we worship the Lord? The four and twenty elders fall down before Him on, uh, that sat on the throne, worship Him that lived forever and ever, and cast their crown before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasure they are and were created. That's the way you worship, folks. And sometimes we're afraid to shed a little tear or show a little emotion. Now some people don't like that. And that's okay with me if that's the way they feel. But has anything ever touched you that made a tear come to your eye? Has anybody ever suffered and it made you hurt so much that you cried? Does any of you ever remember coming to an altar of prayer and receiving the Lord Jesus and tears run down your face? But sometimes we're afraid to show a little emotion in the church. We're afraid to say amen when the preacher preaches something that's right on target. Amen. And sometimes we're afraid to say glory to God because we might interrupt the service a little bit. You just can't do that. That's too emotional. That's too erratic. Think about how they're worshiping. And it doesn't say God's not pleased with it. Let's go over here just a little bit further to Revelation chapter 7. The first part of this chapter is talking about 144,000 Israelites that are sealed. But then it gets down to verse 9. After this I beheld and lo a great multitude, which no man can number, of all nations, kindreds, and people, and, and uh, people and tongues stood before the throne and before the Lamb clothed with white robe, righteousness, and palm branches in their hand. It says palm, but it's palm branches in their hand. And cried with a loud voice, Salvation to our God. Which, do you think that's the way they cried out? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Salvation to our God which sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. And all the angels stood round about the throne and about the elders and the four beasts and fell before the throne on their faces and worshiped God. Let's read this together. You got your Bible? 
Let's read this together. Let's start. Say, Amen. Blessings and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. Just reading these and you see how they worship them. And sometimes we think if I go to church for a little while and maybe I'll sing a hymn and I might even, I might even break down and say an amen if the preacher says something I like. Now, if he says something I don't like, I'm going to get a little bit mad and probably be mad at him for a week or two. And you know that happens sometimes, too, doesn't it? But the truth of it is, even Brother Wayne, maybe it was more this morning, folks, it's going to take a holy people. It's going to take people that's dedicated it's going to take people that's not afraid to worship the Lord and they're going to have to worship Him in the beauty of holiness and half in and half out. And Luke Warm ain't going to get it. He said He's going to spew us out. If we love Him, we need to speak up for Him. We need to worship Him. You need to surprise your ministers. You really do. If you've been slack about this, you need to start surprising them. And when they come to church, they find you all in there already sitting down. Or you find you a place to pray and praying for the minister that the Holy Spirit will anoint them so bad that I mean that it just looks like there, there's an aura about them when they're preaching. And they'll preach beyond their, their normal ability. The Spirit of God will come on them. Things can happen. People's lives can be changed. Folks, we're going to have to wake up and we're going to have to start worshiping God like He needs to be worshipped. Because what, how would it be one day? How would it be? If we stand before Him and like some of the churches are in Revelation, you know, Brother Guy, there, there's some good things. I was pleased. I was pleased that you did some things. But in some other areas, you didn't do what I asked you to do. You wasn't diligent about it. You were slack about it. Wouldn't that be a terrible thing to stand before God and Him say, there were some areas that, I mean, you just went way beyond. I mean, so well in other areas, you just took it for granted and it didn't mean much to you. We're supposed to be the light of the world. I wonder about that. We're supposed to be the light of the world. And some sinner comes to church and perhaps he comes in and he comes on time and then about half of the people who say, I love the Lord, I'm a Christian, I love Him. And they start dragging in a little bit by little. And, and then you start it out with about 15 people. And well, but then the service, we've got a pretty good crowd. There might be 25 or 30 in there. You know I'm telling you the truth because it happens. Matter of fact, I've preached on this so much I'm almost ashamed of myself with the people in Tulsa. I'm kind of telling off on them. But it's like, whoo! That went right over my head. That was, that was for the one sitting next to me. Or that's for that one over there, but that wasn't for me. There's too much of that goes on, folks. It's like it was for somebody else. But I'll just keep on doing it. Like I've been doing. Why does God why does God correct us in any way? You can answer that. Love. Absolutely. And sometimes that correction isn't always always feel so good. But if I asked the parents in here, did you ever correct your children? And I'd say, why did you do that? You'd say, because I was trying to make them better. I was trying to fashion their character. Make them a better person. That's exactly what God does. And oftentimes that's the reason why when the preacher's preaching things, and well, I don't know about that. I guess I could just keep doing what I'm doing. But if there's a little pricking in your heart going on, God's trying to say there needs to be some improvement and why aren't you doing it? Now my father-in-law was a minister and he used to say it this way. You've heard the truth and you've heard the message. 
Now it's up to you. Did you do any examining in your mind when you heard this message? And are you going to use it? Are you going to do anything with it? Are you just going to go right on back to doing things just like you did? And I'm afraid too often that's what happens. And just we, you know, we go away and we say, and I know some of the ministers will say they'll come to me and they'll say, oh, I enjoyed that message. But it doesn't seem like, I, I wonder how much they did enjoy it because they don't seem to, it's just like, well, as soon as I go out the door, I pretty much forgot what he said and I'm just going to go ahead and do what I've always been doing. If you do what you always been doing, you're going to get what you always been getting. Now, my question is, do you want to grow in grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ? Do you want your relationship to be better than it has been? Well, then you're going to have to do your part and say, I'm going to do better. I'm going to start getting involved. I'm going to start doing other things in the church. I'm going to see some other areas where I can grow and where I can get involved. Because see, when you bring an offering, we worship God, and that's the most important thing. But when you bring an offering of your life in some way, it edifies other people in the church. And that's actually the second main objective. I, I try to tell people in the church over there, if, when they sing, I really appreciate you singing because I'd hate to be the only one in here. Uh, I appreciate you singing because it's, it's uplifted me. I like to try to tell the ministers quite often that I appreciate your message. If I get to hear one, don't get to hear them very often anymore. Because you, you were the ones giving them. I say that, I get to hear them myself. And sometimes, Brother Belton, I get convicted by, my, by the messages I'm presenting. So folks, let's be a church we say we want to be a church in the light of the world. We want to be examples. But we're going to have to do more than what we've been doing. We're going to have to get involved. Instead of saying, well, this brother here, he needs to do it. But I'll let him take care of it. I'll, I'll let him do it. Or I'll let this brother do it. And I'll just keep doing like I'm doing. God called every one of us to discipleship. And that doesn't mean you get the rewards but you don't have any responsibility. If you want the rewards, you're going to have to get involved in the responsibilities as well. I'm sure y'all are probably getting ready to eat, but I guess better quit. God bless you.